Remember, let us know your thoughts on the content of this video. Do you agree or disagree? And what solutions are you implementing? Mixed income communities are advertised under the illusionary agenda that it will fight poverty and racism, when in reality it is the most deceitful of all gentrification methods, partly because the people will ask for it. And they said, go to, let us build us a city and a tower, whose top may reach unto heaven. And let us make us a name, lest we be scattered abroad upon the face of the whole earth. And the Lord came down to see the city and the tower, which the children of men builded. And the Lord said, Behold, the people is one, and they have all one language, and this they begin to do, and now nothing will be restrained from them, which they have imagined to do. Go to, let us go down, and therefore confound their language, that they may not understand one another's speech. So the Lord scattered them abroad from thence upon the face of all the earth, and they left off to build the city. The West has had an obsession with tall buildings dating back to the Tower of Babel in the Bible. It is as if the rich thrive with anticipation to look down at the poor in a capitalistic society. To the wealthy, the higher the building, the higher the status in society. The higher their status in society, the further they're away from rock bottom. In the West, to get high is to escape the problems of society by temporarily being in a state of chemical-induced bliss. Western cultural and language is filled with contrasts between highs and lows economically, spiritually, and mentally. The Tower of Babel becomes the Tower of Confusion as the residents began to speak various languages. Likewise, today we see the same confusion amongst mixed-income communities. The phrase, money talks, is well known, but in what language does it speak? Apparently, for low-income blacks and high-income whites, it's two different languages. The holiday season is a long-standing American tradition to spend time with loved ones. Any disputes or grievances are temporarily set aside to enjoy the holidays. Anticipating grandma's delicious cooking and your aunt's side dishes were guaranteed to have you returning for second and third plates. Your uncles and grandfather laugh as they tell jokes and reminisce on the past, filling the youth in attendance with wisdom for the future. Advertisers want you to believe that receiving gifts are the best part of the holidays versus spending quality time with family. However, if the push for mixed income communities continues at its current pace, the broken family structure will continue to erode. But how did we get in this predicament in the first place? After leaving the inner city decades ago via white flight, why is government spending marketing for them to return? Instances of white flight started as early as the 1920s due to the great migrations of blacks up north. When the government tried to integrate into schools, the remaining white communities fought back. Historically, white flight serves as a classic example as to why mixed income communities don't work, even today. After decades of urban failure with project public housing and demolishing them, HUD wants to erroneously initiate mixed income communities nationally with the hopes of alleviating poverty. Ironically, the same reason black and white communities couldn't coexist 60 years ago remains today. Bill Clinton's Moving to Opportunity initiatives in 1994 sought to integrate blacks from the projects to the suburbs. Obama sought to promulgate the Fair Housing Act of 1968 to remind people that segregation is wrong and suburban landlords should accept housing vouchers. Now the Mixed Income Initiative, although not new, is growing momentum, promoting an integration agenda despite centuries of blacks and whites not being able to live side by side. Will the government learn that you cannot force whites nor blacks to integrate amongst each other?
Before we begin, we must note a major flaw of the housing system process, which is housing vouchers. Mixed income people are selected via a housing voucher or lottery. The average waiting list for housing vouchers may vary. The only way to move up on the list is if someone who already receives it has a rise in income or dies, which rarely happens. The major flaw in the housing lottery is similar to the flaw in the everyday lottery, the false promise of hope that it generates. 70% of people who win the lottery are broke within three to five years, and some waiting lists extend for decades after a long, drawn-out process. There are countless reasons as to why the waiting lists are so long in the first place. Obviously, who would turn down a better living situation if they're living in poverty? Here are four proposed mechanisms used to push the mixed income agenda, why they don't alleviate poverty and promote a self-destructive codependency on the system. Mechanism number one, social network, whereby poor people expand their job search and acquisition networks. The premise of social networking is that by low-income residents networking with their high-income neighbors, economic opportunities will be presented to them. Social networking fails to alleviate poverty because there is no guarantee that these jobs will offer higher wages, job security, career ladders, or employment in the first place. Researchers Rosenbaum and Popkin found this to be true in their 1991 Gautreaux Housing Mobility Program in Chicago, even though families that moved with Gautreaux were more likely to hold jobs compared to their former inner city counterparts. Their wages were no higher. MTO families that moved to low poverty areas also had higher employment rates than families that had not moved but about the same hourly wage. Social networking in mixed income communities breeds dependency by placing responsibility on high income residents to provide job opportunities. Instead, residents should be provided with career related job training in a stable profession to ensure long term economic stability. High income residents often come from different backgrounds than their low income neighbors. As a result, they either fail to understand or don't care about their advancement in a capitalistic society. Mechanism number two, social control, where the presence of higher income people leads to higher levels of accountability to establish norms and rules followed by increased order and safety. It assumes that residents lack moral compass and ignores the external influences that keep low-income areas in chronic poverty. The social control mechanism will fail to alleviate poverty because it operates on the assumption that crime exists because of a lack of higher income role models as opposed to lack of employment. Communities where people have more stable employment tend to be safer it has nothing to do with accountability. Crimes are often committed out of necessity and not because of a lack of role models. Furthermore, it shows that higher income residents' safety are prioritized over low income residents. All residents have a right to safety, no matter their income or race. At best, this will create safer mixed income communities where crime will occur in other communities which doesn't really solve crime at all, rather it delays it. Extra police presence in their neighborhood, coupled with mixed income development, will immediately make existing residents insecure about their access to resources. The social control mechanism furthers codependency by placing responsibility on residents who often don't understand the culture of the communities they're moving into. Furthermore, the savior complex associated with many high-income residents is validated by this mechanism. Instead, residents and police community relations should be the focus to make communities safer. Police should report corrupt officers and residents should have more unity in protecting their neighborhood. This should be the focus of all communities, mixed income or not.
Mechanism number three, behavior modification in which higher income residents model alternate lifestyles and norms, which in turn promote behavioral change and increased self-efficacy among low-income residents. Mechanism number three will fail to alleviate poverty because high-income residents fail to have a positive influence, if any at all, with their low-income counterparts. Cross-income interactions tend to be infrequent and superficial. Within Chicago's Lake Park Place development, simple interactions such as greeting residents in passing were common. Rosenbaum, Stroh, and Flynn, 1998, found that residents talked to neighbors for more than 10 minutes about once per month and shared a meal with another resident about once per year. Both higher and low income residents reported a greater number of friends within their income group than outside of it. Mechanism number three further breeds codependency on external forces outside of low-income residents in their ability to change if given the proper opportunity and resources. Many low-income residents have multiple streams of income to compensate for the lack of employment and educational opportunities in the first place. Therefore, they are self-sufficient. This mechanism furthers the attack on black male role models and father figures in the household. It also nurtures the codependency of the government to provide for single parents rather than restore family structure that was destroyed by drugs and unemployment. Based on their review of the literature, Brophy, Garcia, and Pooley, 2008-2010, find that it is insufficient for low-income people to live next to people of different income and class in order to realize gains in self-sufficiency. Efforts to promote upward mobility need to be intentional, focused in purpose, and included in development's budgets. Lastly, controversy has surrounded HUD for tearing apart black families by giving women an incentive to remain single by providing affordable housing at the expense of not having the father in the household because of extra income, by depending on high-income residents to be models to low-income residents rather than restore broken families further confirms the agenda to split up black families. Mechanism number four. The presence of higher income residents will create new market demand and effective political pressure that will lead to higher quality goods and services for all residents. The fourth mechanism fails to alleviate poverty by catering to high-income residents' political needs more than low-income residents. If high-income residents are expected to be role models, provide social networks, and make the community safer by their very presence alone, it's fair to say that resources will be prioritized in their favor. The political power is often felt before the high-income residents even arrive. For example, Boston's Mary Ellen McCormick Housing Project will receive $1.6 billion for redevelopment for mixed income existing residents will wonder why even half of this money wasn't spent on them prior to a mixed income agenda. Furthermore, the poor door controversy at the luxury Lincoln Square several years ago also exposed the contrast in amenities. The New York Post made note of the differences. For renters on the poor side, a bike storage place and an unfurnished laundry room. And for their high income residents, two gyms, pool, movie theater, bowling alley, and a 24 seven doorman. The fourth mechanism furthers low income codependency by expecting high income residents to advocate for low income residents rather than low-income residents advocating on their own behalf. Low-income residents live in areas that have been neglected by elected officials who give false hope. Drugs being planted to destroy families and underfunded schools. As a result, low-income residents don't have much faith in the system to help them. Rather than using high-income residents as a medium to advocate on behalf of low-income residents, 
instead restore hope into the low-income residents' community by admitting neglect on behalf of the government and actually listening to and apply their concerns the best way possible. Mixed-income communities aren't in the suburbs because the suburbs aren't being gentrified. The inner city is. In conclusion, while the latest studies show that mixed-income communities have been highly ineffective in alleviating poverty and better race relations, billions of dollars are still being put into the initiative. Why? Because it's what the people want, which makes it so dangerous. The waiting list for housing vouchers alone proves this. Oppressed people rarely see the value in self-sufficiency, and understandably so. In the minds of low-income residents, their demand for mixed-income communities is a response to the years of neglect. Meanwhile, the government is manipulating their vulnerability by giving them a hard-to-refuse offer with a hidden fee. Realistically, will women wait for men to complete school and job training, which would take years, or apply for a housing voucher? While it is important, the bigger question is not whether mixed income alleviates poverty, but rather, why are waiting lists so high for government-assisted housing? It reminds me of the pretty woman, or the successful handsome man, that you want to love. After being swept off your feet with their charm and status, you move in with them, only to find out you made the worst mistake of your life. Hidden insecurities and other unforeseeable problems make the situation inhabitable. Likewise, is the promise of mixed income communities once you decide to move in. To alleviate centuries of poverty would require the most complex of surgeries, whereas mixed communities is just a platinum crusted band aid. Man has tried for thousands of years to appease his so called love for God by building the highest towers, churches, and chapels in his name. Building higher buildings will not bring you closer to God. While tall buildings may leave people in awe, it doesn't move God at all. Until next time, think independently and strive for intelligence. Your future depends on it.